Honesty, passion, experience. It's Timberwolves Explosion, hosted on the sportstuff.com. And now, your host, Paladino Joey. Hello again, Timberwolves fans. Are you ready for the explosion of Timberwolves basketball? I am your host, Paladino Joey, or Joey Awajan. Timberwolves Explosion is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Double Twist. Thank you once again, and always, for joining me today here on Timberwolves Explosion. Timberwolves are playing significantly better, despite the fact, well, Carl Anthony Towns is out, Andrew Wiggins is out. Carl Anthony Towns Andrew is out, Andrew Wiggins is out. Rolls right off your tongue. But, uh, yeah, and then you get... Uh, Trevian Graham out, so the Wolves finally won a game without Trevian Graham. That's good. That's really nice, actually. <laughs> uh, Noah Vunley's out. Uh, uh, Glenn Taylor's out. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's I, I don't know what else to say, but uh, injuries this, sickness that. And the Timberwolves are playing significantly better. You get Gorgie Zhang, Shabazz Napier, of all people. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. Timberwolves go 500, 2-2 two two in the last four. <laughs> Definitely got a great show for you today. Lots to talk about, of course, of the games, the improved play by this guy, the statistics here and there, some surprising statistics, the seesaw battle between offense, defense, defense, offense, with the absence of a certain player. Yeah, interesting statistic there. Uh, and then, well, and then you got the death of uh, David Stern, the longtime commissioner, of course, 1984 to 2014. The whole Michael Jordan era, he got lucky with that part, but then again, the way he marketed Michael Jordan. I mean, you know, that's that, that was skill more than luck. The luck was the fact that Jordan came right at that time. So, obviously, David Stern, one hell of a commissioner. In fact, most people would say the best commissioner in the history of professional sports. Uh, definitely an argument you could make uh, throughout the... Uh, definitely an argument you could make throughout uh, sports history for David Stern. He's actually the only... Uh, he's actually the only commissioner I've actually seen in person, very close actually with my aunt Don Dahlberg years ago, uh, early 2000s, 2000, 2001-ish, 2000-ish, right around then he came to Target Center and well, we got like front row seats, I don't know how, I don't know how she did it, but amazing stuff, uh, front row seats, that's just unbelievable considering, I mean, whew, I mean, it's David Bleep and Stern, uh, we were on the, in, in the Target Center floor there, but David Stern talking with everybody, and uh, Leo B. Olson was interviewing him. It was pretty cool. I mean, it was David Stern, and obviously you saw how short the guy is, uh, and all that, so very interesting. We'll talk about him more in the final segment, kind of. Uh, so we're going to go down memory lane a bit today, which is good. Uh, I, that's one of my gifts, is going down memory lane. That'll be in segment number three. I'll kind of save it for then on the Facebook page. I'm sure some people hopefully commented a little bit on there, but um, lots to talk about there. In a small amount of time, because <laughs> obviously, you know, they, I only have so much time to be able to do the show every uh, every week here, because, uh, you know, obviously schedules are what they are, this and this and that and that, blah, blah, blah. We all we all have our schedules. Nothing new, right? Nothing new in adult life. Great, uh, well, great week for the Timberwolves, considering their situation with everybody hurt. It was, a, it was a pretty good week. You had the yucky Sacramento game that went to double overtime. Obviously, that was the last week, so it was finally turning the corner, finally being able to win a game here and there. And then you host the Cleveland Cavaliers on the 28th. Again, hope all of you had a happy new year. It was okay. To me, it's just, you know, kind of a little more of the same, of course. Now we get a presidential election again, leap year, summer Olympics, and all that good stuff, of course, uh, David Stern, definitely big in the Summer Olympic department as well with the the Dream Team and all that, 92, and Dream Team 96, and so, yeah, he, he he did a hell of a job, didn't he, David Stern? He did. Uh, can't like everything he did, but uh, <laughs> nobody can like everything he did because he's a commissioner. Not everybody's going to agree with every single thing a commissioner does because not everything's going to favor you at the end of the day. I think the Timberwolves, they, we've been on both sides of the equation there, big time. Like the existence of the Timberwolves. Yeah, okay, we'll get back to that later. Um, I just love talking about history. I just love it. Cleveland and Minnesota, the history is all over the place of that one, too. Uh, you go all the way back to, you know, Mark Price and such beating the Timberwolves badly in Cleveland years ago. LeBron James basically always beats the Timberwolves, except very way back when he was a rookie, and I was actually at the game. Or no, second-year player. I was actually at the game, and the Wolves were still pretty decent. Um, 
Well, now I'm getting it mixed up again. When he was a rookie, the Timberwolves did beat him because the Timberwolves were the best team in the league that year until Sam Gassell hurt his back. Uh, the second year, Cleveland was significantly better and the Wolves were significantly worse. Yeah, remember that year where, yeah, everything went down big time? And I mean down, down. Yeah, that was depressing. But uh, this Cleveland game was depressing as well. No Kevin Love. No Carl Anthony Towns. Dean Wade. Dean Wade. That's funny. Dean Wade. So somebody named Dean Wade is on the Cleveland roster. <laughs> Dean, uh, yeah, okay, it's funny, I know. Uh, Covington's shot attempts, that's another That's another conversation out there that's like, I don't get it. I mean, okay, you know, there's games where he's like 5 of 9. And then there's games where he's 5 of 13 and 5 of 15 and 5 of 17. It's like always when he's shooting poorly, he shoots more. I, I And I keep talking about that, and that's just how it is. He did get four steals in the game. Gorgie Zhang got four steals. Norgie did not shoot well in this game, was not efficient, but he did a ton of intangible things throughout the night. Napier, this was easily his worst game of the week, and this is where it kind of fed my, you know, fueled my fire against him, as I was always giving him Johnny Flynn memorials this year, and I've been bashing him up and down every single game, it seemed like, because it's kind of annoying to watch sometimes, you know, until the next three games, when he looks completely different. I mean, a completely different player out there. I mean, there's a lot of the same recklessness, Reckless driving to the basket. Reckless driving. Yeah, you could give him a ticket, right? <laughs> yeah, but it was... <laughs> suffice to say, he can be annoying to watch sometimes, but when he's on, and when he's focused, and when he's just playing a good game, he is... He's a, he's, he's not bad, is he? He makes you believe he'll, he'll tease you a little bit. I mean, Sebastian Telford did that a lot, too. Some of those catch-and-shoot threes, the way he would set other players up as well. Four catch-and-shoot threes, you know, obviously him getting catch-and-shoot threes, blah, 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 and driving to the hoop and making nice dishes for dunks here and there. He reminds me a lot of Sebastian Telfer, I'm telling you, uh, the good and the bad. But uh, when the good comes out, he actually might even be a little bit better than what Telfer was. Uh, Keelan Martin had a nice dunk in the game, but 15 shot attempts for Keelan Martin. He still got to 17 points, but that's not very efficient. Jeff Teague, I, I don't know what to go with him. He did shoot 50% in the game, so I can't bash him too much. Noah Vunley was very efficient in the time he was out there. Uh, very efficient. Gosh, 8 of 9 and all that. He was awesome. Akogi was kind of all over the place. He does a ton of intangible things, but some nights the guy just cannot shoot, and this was one of them. Uh, drives you crazy sometimes. But, uh, yeah, he's another guy that can drive you absolutely crazy. The crazy, the wild, reckless driving to the hoop and the turnovers and okay, and then he can't make this and he can't make that and he can't make this and he can't make that, but then he makes a really nice athletic block. He'll get a Huge rebound when you're desperately needed. Just a great hustle player is Josh Okoki. So when he's not shooting well, at least he does a lot of other little things that'll make you happy. I, I feel the same about Jared Culver, actually, very much so. <clears throat> Culver, I think there's a little more going on there, though. I do. Uh, in the Bucks game, he's had some moments where it's like, this guy, there, there's something there. I'm going to keep saying it. I'm going to keep saying it because it's obvious. There's something there with Jared Culver. He needs to bulk up a bit. Uh, needs to bulk up a bit. Uh, his shot needs to improve. Consistency, this and that. But when all that kind of starts to come together, watch out. I think he's going to be a pretty good player. I do. And I'm saying that from experience. I've been watching the game forever. Obviously, watching the game, following the game, debating the game, and, and covering the game with Tim Rose Explosion. Obviously, so this is like year number 12 already. And Tim Rose Explosion's got to be the oldest Tim Rose podcast on the planet. And it's going to continue to be because I'm not going anywhere. So it's just going to keep getting older. And you can't catch up if I'm still here. So <laughs> long as running and all that. Yep. Damn it. Damn it. I'm going to be like the, the Sid Hartman of uh, Timberwolves podcasting, if you know what I mean. The guy's turning 100 in a couple of months. Unbelievable. <laughs> yep. I'm going to be the Sid Hartman of Timberwolves podcasting. <laughs> This was not a very fun game. Timberwolves couldn't hit crap. Cleveland was just kind of, you know, Cleveland was just better in this game. That's just all there is to say. Colin Sexton, uh, and of course the guy that we wish we could have had. It wasn't our fault. We tried to get you, Darius, so try not to rub it in our face too much. Uh, I, I, you know, it was a sloppy game. There were turnovers everywhere. Sexton and Garland combined for 11 turnovers. Kevin Porter Jr. has got a little attitude to him. You can see it. It's there. He had four turnovers in the game. Cleveland had 28 turnovers in the game. 28 turnovers. 28. Yeah. 28 turnovers in the game. And, and 11 by your two starting guards. And you lose because you just couldn't score for crap. 17 point third quarter. 22 point second. 
Never got to 30 points in a single quarter. Wound up with uh, a number that some people love, 88. It's a cool number, but it's not a good final score. I mean, with that many turnovers, you'd think 88 would be our point total after like three quarters or maybe early fourth. 28 turnovers and you can't win? God almighty, finish, you sons of biscuits. Or some other swear word. Come on, man. Some some more serious words. Sons of, yeah, okay, sons of bitches. Finish, for crying out loud, finish. Just, just finish on your shots, please. Capitalize. Instead of, like, turning it back over again. Like, Okogi, Napier in this game, too. I mean, how many opportunities? See, it was games like this, again, why I was bashing Napier. You get the turnover. Here we go. You get the turnover. Or Covington gets the turnover. And the ball's rolling on the floor, going back to Cleveland. What is that? What the hell is that crap? Or you go up with some weak-ass shot, and it just rolls off the rim or bounces off the backboard, or it's a frickin' air ball. And that's the kind of game this was. That's about all I gotta say. 94-88 Cleveland. 28 turnovers, and there's Ryan Saunders right there. The image is perfect. Where he just kind of got that, huh, huh. You know, that look like, huh. This is great. That kind of look. And, yep, I mean, you're seeing more and more frustration and competitiveness out of Ryan Saunders than you saw early on. He's starting to get more and more comfortable in his skin as an NBA head coach, and that's good. You saw it in the Brooklyn. The Brooklyn game is going to be the final game of 2019, and the Timberwolves end 2019 very nicely in an extremely entertaining basketball game. Extremely entertaining game, and games like this are why Gorgie Zhang, even though he didn't shoot particularly well in the game, this is why he got, well, he didn't get all that many attempts either. This is a, a game, this is why he got the Alpha Wolf the last week, and I was considering him strongly for it again this week until someone else kind of took over the game down the stretch and continued to play spectacularly well. Uh, Jared Culver had his first multi-three-point game ever, which is kind of sad, but he, you know, you get a little trigger happy. You start getting more and more comfortable, like, I can shoot, I can shoot now. I can fly. Look, Mom, I can fly. Okay, Dumbo, stop shooting. And now I'm not necessarily calling him names, but, you know, Dumbo, the character... Yeah, you know, yeah. Just, just slow down a little bit, but 21 shot attempts for Jared Culver, are you are you sure? Like, I, I don't know if he's ready for 21 shot attempts, but I guess when you don't have anybody else, practically, I mean, geez, geez, yeah, Andrew Wiggins is sick. Andrew Wiggins is sick. Andrew Wiggins is sick. Andrew Wiggins is sick. Towns is still out with a knee sprain, and I mean, yeah, you could tell that was a pretty nasty fall. Another guy who said, look, Mom, I can fly. I like the way he played, but Dude, 16 attempts for Nas Reed. I mean, you've only played 19 minutes, 20 minutes, 16 attempts. What the heck? 5 of 16. It's Yeah, he made a couple of shots early, and then it was just brick, 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 brick. 10 three-point attempts. Yeah, you can shoot the three a little bit, Nas Reed. And uh, later on, as we head into Golden State and such, and even uh, Milwaukee, I'm starting to get a little vibe from Nas Reed as well. Um, that smooth release he has from three, you know who he reminds me of? And kind of, he almost looks like him eh, a little bit, not really. But he reminds me of him, like similar size, in sense. Kind of a, you know, he's like a short center, basically, is what Nazareth is. You can tell he's not a, a seven foot legitimate center in the NBA. He's like a six nine center, right? Are you ready? Sam Perkins. Nazareth reminds me of Sam Perkins a little bit. And that could be his career potential, kind of a, a stretch, four or five. You know, with that smooth release where he doesn't really, he hardly really jumps on his threes. He just kind of just whoop, lets it go, just a little flick, like uh, Sam Perkins did. So he reminds me of Sam a little bit back in the day. Seattle Supersonics, Los Angeles Lakers. I think he played for the Pacers later on in his career, but played a ton of his career with the Seattle Supersonics after being traded for uh, Benoit Benjamin, uh, Lakers Sonics years ago. So uh, that was a pretty good trade for the Sonics, considering Benoit Benjamin just rotted on the Lakers bench, just rotted there. And he was just kind of like a de facto, yeah, yeah, I'm the center, I guess. You know, that kind of guy for Seattle in the in the early days. So early 90s off to uh, the Lakers where he just rotted on the bench behind whoever, Vladi Divac and such. Um, eventually Shaq, I think he was still there when Shaq was there. I, I don't know. He wasn't much. He didn't get a whole lot of action, but... Sam Perkins played forever. Not Hall of Fame type of player, but great college player with Michael Jordan. Yeah. Unfortunately, Sam Perkins never won an NBA title, but he did get a national title with Michael Jordan in 1982. Yeah, with all the good old days back then. The good old boys in 1982 there. Um, yeah, but Nasri does remind me of Sam Perkins a little bit. But uh, th this game, he'd say, okay, you made a couple shots, you and Culver, but you got a little bit too excited. Bottom line, though, I'm not here to bash the way the Timberwolves played in this game. 
I apologize if it might come off that way right now. Uh, there's a little too much of that sometimes where guys get a little too excited, but Covington, Martin, guys like that, Keita Bates, Jop, and I continue to call him Jop because I do believe that's the correct pronunciation. They all made half of their shots. Uh, Shabazz Napier, who I got frustrated, was bashing and bashing and bashing, and then you get later in the game. And then he became a cold-blooded killer, and wow, that was awesome. Shabazz Napier started hitting threes. He continued to drive to the hoop, but he made a weird off-angle shot in the overtime period and then nailed the dagger with the three. Off-angle shot, I was like, oh, that was pure luck. I mean, he wasn't even angled right to the basket. and went right in there, put the Wolves up by four, and then he hit the uh, and then he hit the dagger three. Ultimately, half of his threes went in, three of six, 24 points, eight assists, dished the ball around nicely after being very sloppy earlier on in the game. Again, typical four turnovers, so it's like two-to-one assist-to-turnover ratio. That's not that good, but... He was extremely clutch, and see, he made up for the mistakes earlier in the game and previous games, and really stepped up nicely against his former club, the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, Brooklyn Nets are a 500 team. Uh, The Wolves are at home, but the Nets had, you know, they had some decent players. Obviously, Dinwiddie torched us the entire night, like he always does. 36 points. He's just been torching the Wolves. Uh, He did shoot a lot of attempts, though, in the game. He wasn't that great. Got a little too trigger-happy as did a lot of the Brooklyn Nets down the stretch. This game did have to go to OT because the Wolves couldn't finish in uh, the uh, fourth quarter. They were playing so well, though. It looked like Brooklyn was going to win the game, and then the Wolves kind of kept getting closer. Shabazz Napier with some nice dishes. A missed layup as well, but Gorgie Zhang started really picking things up, and those 20 rebounds were just freaking huge. Uh, he ended up following out, falling, fouling out at the end of the day. Unfortunately, Robert Covington had five fouls like very early in the fourth quarter but still hung in there and did not foul out. Uh, Big three down the stretch for Robert Covington as well, and the Wolves ended up beating the Brooklyn Nets in one of the more fun games of the season. No Wiggins, no Towns, no problem. Napier, Zhang, Culver did did a good job. Uh, Very, very respectable job down the stretch. Uh, Timberwolves took advantage. I mean, I, I can't imagine how frustrated this team was after, you know, not winning a game at home against a pretty crappy Cleveland team. Young, but, I mean, there, there's some young, young, talented players. I'm not ready to call them stars yet. They're not ready for that yet. Uh, Sexton and Garland, they're not ready to be stars yet. They're just not there yet. 29, uh, 28 turnovers and you don't even win? Like, come on. Ugh, ugh. And, you know, they only scored 94 points. It's not like they torched us. It was all the just the, oh, I took it, but here, you, here I'll give it back to you with either a missed shot or a, just can't even hang on to the bleeping ball, that type of situation. Stupid crap, but, uh, well, Brooklyn would be in the playoffs today, believe it or not, with a seventh seed, because the bottom of the East is still kind of weak. That's where some people might say the East is the least still, because eh, a little bit. Wow, the Spurs would make the playoffs with a record five games under five hundred. That's weird. Weird. Oklahoma City would make it, though, and uh, I don't think a lot of us are rooting for Oklahoma City right now. <laughs> this was a very fun, entertaining game, bottom line, Gorgie Zhang. Big time rebounding down the stretch, and Shabazz Napier was awesome. He was flat out awesome. So, I can I can chill on him a little bit now. I, I can. Uh, Milwaukee game, another very entertaining game. And you're going against the Greek freak. You're going against the whole Bucks here. This is a legitimate Bucks team that's only lost five games all season. Best record in the league. They might win seventy games this year. They're going to win sixty five ish at least. They might win seventy games though. And uh, damn, <laughs> maybe they're going to be like the Warriors years ago where they got like 65, 67 wins and just they just won the title, you know. They just kind of rolled and won the NBA title. Maybe it's just going to be their year, despite a lot of people thinking Budenholzer isn't the, the right coach. Maybe he's like a the equivalent of what Marty Schottenheimer was in the NFL, like great records, 13-3, and 14-2, and 12-4, and four, and you never go anywhere. You know, you, you, you don't even get to the the Super Bowl or, the, or whatever, because Marty Schottenheimer never coached in the Super Bowl, yet he had one of the best regular season records ever, so... Hopefully that's not the case for Budenholzer. Very entertaining situation with uh, Robin Lopez and Jared Culver, too, down the stretch. See, this is these are moments where you think Jared Culver, there, there's something there. The way he drove to the basket and just dunked it hard on uh, Robin Lopez. And uh, <laughs> it was a back-and-forth situation. Culver wound up getting a, a technical foul for taunting. Hard to believe Jared Culver, a good young Christian boy, kind of a shy guy sometimes. But he's got an aggressive streak, and... Well, good for him. It was a great play. It was an absolutely great play. And there's something there. I don't think he cursed at him. He just 
had something I had to say. I can't. I couldn't really read his lips. Robin wanted a piece of him there. He looks just like his brother, doesn't he? But uh, longer hair. <laughs> yeah, more hippie looking, I guess. But uh, what a fun game this was. This is a very fun game. Uh, Greek Freak had one move after another. He was hitting, catching, shoot threes, pull up threes. He was doing whatever he wanted, basically, because he's, you know, he's the MVP of basketball right now. A lot of people would say he's kind of a, a new LeBron James, basically, with a unique twist to his game. He kind of makes everything look easy. Uh, other players didn't step up that great, necessarily. Uh, DiVincenzo only attempted three shots in the game, but it didn't matter because other players were hitting their shots. I barely even noticed Cal Cover out there, but he made half of his threes. George Hill, blah, blah, blah. It's a good, solid team, but of course, you got probably the best player in the league right now in the Greek Freak. I still can't say it. Uh, Giannis, I still can't say it. Uh, Chris Middleton did not shoot well in the game. That helped the Wolves' cause down the stretch. Brooke Lopez couldn't make a three for his life in this game for some reason. He'd been struggling majorly from downtown after a great uh, start, uh, after a great run last year. He was hitting threes like crazy, but this year, not so much. It's just, I don't know. Uh, six blocks for Brooke Lopez also down the stretch. Gorgie Zhang solid in the game. Some good moments and some not so good moments. Field goal percentage is dipping down there, way down into the 30s for uh, Gorgie in this one. Same with Culver. 14 attempts, only 5 makes, but that big aggressive dunk and of course getting 8 rebounds, dishing out 5 assists. He couldn't make a 3 for his life though. Uh, 0 for 5 for Culver. That's disappointing after hitting 3 of them in his previous game. Napier, the best player again though. Best player again. Napier, 4 of 7 from downtown, dishing the assists, getting some rebounds. A, a tiny guy like that, getting 6 rebounds is pretty impressive. Nice hustle. Um, his assist to turnover ratio is just not there, unfortunately. It's like 1 to 2... 1.5 to 2, it's like, okay, or 1.5 to 1, whatever. Oof, duh, it's not good, but hey, he's putting the ball in the basket. He's keeping the Wolves in the mix. 22-point uh, effort. Very fun back-and-forth game. I, I, I enjoyed this. Uh, Nas Reed, this is, again, Sam Perkins. Looked like Sam Perkins out there. A little less field goal attempts, but he made a couple threes again. Jalen Noel was very solid. Very solid. It's like... Who's that guy? Oh, that's right, Jalen Noel. You know, he was he was solid out there. Not great, but one up with 12 points at the end of the day. Hit a couple threes. Again, a little trigger happy for his role, but whatever. You know, that's his game. He's an offensive player. Um, <laughs> Jordan Bell. Yeah, he had some moments as well. Like looked like he put his hand through the hoop against uh, the Nets a couple days earlier. That was kind of funny, but. Uh, this was a nice New Year's Day game. Unfortunately, the Wolves could not finish down the stretch. Didn't like the way they executed the final dry, uh, final attempt there. Wolves got within two points. They had the ball. I say if you can, go for the three. You try to get out of there with the win because I don't think you're going to beat them in the overtime period. It's the Milwaukee Bucks, and it's in their house. Wolves never win in Milwaukee, even when they stink. Certainly not now. Um, I don't know. I, I, I wish the Wolves could have executed a little better play. But down the stretch, it ended up being Gorgie Zhang forcing up a long two that did not fall, and that was kind of all she wrote, unfortunately. So, unfortunately, Wolves do not get the win against the Bucks. Last night, the Golden State Warriors back-to-back -back situation for the Timberwolves. The infamous go-back-to-work January 2nd that everybody hates. Um, not that bad attendance. I mean, they're not the Minnesota Wild. They're not getting sellouts or near sellouts every night. So it is what it is, obviously. And, of course, everybody's the same old thing. This guy's sick. This guy's uh, hurt. This guy's sick. And now D'Angelo Russell's out, which is funny. He has a shoulder contusion. And uh, shoulder contusion, and don't talk to me about contusions right now because let's just say I have a very large one in my lower back area and stuff. It's, yeah, <laughs> it hurts. It hurts. Yes, it hurts a lot. Um, <laughs> it's uh, That's basically what's going on with uh, Mr. Uh, well, yeah, with uh, um, Noah Vonley. Yeah, he has a he has a he has a left. What do they call it? Left gluteus, left gluteus contusion. I guess mine would be right gluteus and uh, lower back. It is bad. Yeah, it's bad. Let's just say I landed very hard, very hard on concrete steps. Yeah, on Saturday. And thank God I didn't put my hand in the way. Let's just leave that as is. Uh, Sam Perkins, Nas Reed, three of six from downtown. Again, again, that nice, smooth, silky release. Watch watch Sam Perkins, youngsters or veterans that may have forgotten about Perkins or, you know, it's been because it's been many years. Sam Perkins, we haven't seen him play in like 20 years or so. It's been a long time. Um, old timers like me, 40-year-old guy now. Old timer a bit. Not super old, but old enough 
old enough. <laughs> that nice, smooth, silky release by Sam Perkins, and not uh, just watch Nas Reed and Sam Perkins a little bit, and uh, you'll see you, you'll see some similarities. It's it's there, it's there. Uh, Perkins did hang out around the perimeter a lot. He was not a twenty rebound guy, though. Nas might be able to get some double doubles, I'm sure. But I can see him being more of that kind of guy, Sam Perkins type, and he's you know he's definitely got a future in the league. A lot of people have gushed about him. Uh, Jordan McLaughlin is called back up from Iowa, and he didn't have a particularly good game, but I guess it didn't matter. I guess uh, Jordan Bell got posterized in the game. Uh, that was not very pleasant. <laughs> At the end of the day, that one bugged me. Oh gosh, that was from Spellman, I believe. Amari Spellman just. Uh, Put that sucker right through the right between the eyes. That was a pretty harsh uh, dunk there. Glenn Robinson the third started a small forward, former Timberwolf. I wouldn't mind having him on the uh, on the roster right now. He's he's a solid player. He's been in the league a while. Draymond Green. I mean, he, you know, as valuable player as he's been in the NBA for years. If he's the best player, they're not going to win a whole lot. It's just you know he can't lead a team by himself. There's no way. There's just not a whole lot going on. I mean, Damian Lee, Alec Burks, who actually did play very well against Minnesota when they beat us a couple of weeks ago. That was crappy. Marquis Chris, like the 9,000th stretch four in the NBA, he actually didn't attempt a three in the game. Stretch four, stretch five. There's about 9,000 of them now. Uh, Warriors, boy, they were completely depleted. Only 23-point attempts, which is probably a record low for them the last eight to ten years. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, look at the guys that were out. D'Angelo Russell, Willie Colley-Stein, Steph Curry, Kevin Looney, and Clay. Thompson, K. Clay, Trey Thompson, um, Robert Covington, very solid in the game. Certainly wasn't perfect, but he was very, very solid. Jabaz Napier dishing the ball around, unbelievable efficiency. But again, the turnover ratio, eh, it's not getting better. Four turnovers to seven assists. You know, it's at least he got more assists. But I'm telling you, it's not a great ratio. It, that, that's what happens with Napier. That's why you can't call him a full time starter. But still a very solid game. Just playing exactly like he has, but with more efficiency in this one. He didn't jack up crazy shots as much. He was just very solid. Still won up at 20 points at only 9 attempts. Got to the line. Made half his threes. I mean, great. Great job by uh, Shabazz Napier. Loved what he was able to do. Culver, not good, and generally speaking, 1 of 8. I don't know. I, I get it. I'm sure Ryan Saunders is telling him to keep shooting. Just keep it up. If you got an open shot, go for it. And eventually it's going to turn around, but one of eight, I don't know. I get a little frustrated when that happens. When he just keeps throwing it up and you keep missing and keep missing and keep missing. It gets really old, but I can't complain that much. This was a pretty easy game at the end of the day. I can't really whine and bitch. I mean, it was the Wolves came out to a pretty solid lead in the second half of the first quarter, and there was just nothing more to say the rest of the way. It was just kind of a smooth sailing, solid game for Minnesota. I guess the team that has almost nobody playing, and Wolves have almost nobody playing, so, you know, we can't feel too sorry for the Golden State Warriors. Uh, it's a group of players with Minnesota that deserve minutes in the NBA. You know, Keelan Martin deserves minutes. He's not a great player, but he deserves minutes. Gorgie absolutely deserves minutes. Uh, only six attempts. Uh, I, I like to see Gorgie be a little more aggressive or, you know, given more opportunities. But, I don't know. I mean, Covington was very solid and locked in in the game. He wound up with a double-double. So, good for... Robert Covington, 11 three attempts. Jeez, a lot of games he doesn't even attempt 11 shots. 11 three attempts. <laughs> but no, love. Uh, I love that smooth Sam Birkin shot that uh, Nas Reed has. I think he's going to have a nice nice future in the NBA long term. And Kader Bates Jop also had a pretty big three that kept the Wolves rolling, rolling down the stretch. Easy win for Minnesota. So with that said, we're going to wrap up the segment with the uh, weekly awards. The Alpha Wolf Award is going to go to a guy I've been beating up the last month or so after he started the season solidly. Uh, what a nice week. Again, I'd like to see him protect the basketball a little better, you know, this and that. But he kind of is what he is. And that's Shabazz Napier. He's going to bring in the Alpha Wolf Award. Congratulations after all that. I apologize for bashing you so much. But I don't know. Maybe it was well-deserved. I, I don't know. But the uh, Alpha Wolf is well-deserved today for sure. The uh, Johnny Flynn Memorial. Who do I go with here? Ah, oh, man. Just the sickness, the injuries, the frustration. Um, sometimes I just get super frustrated with some of the forced attempts. Uh, I don't really want to beat up on Jordan McLaughlin. He had a really nice game a couple of weeks ago against, I can't remember who he played. Was it Boston or something? Really nice game. No, Golden State. That was the last Golden State game. He played super well in that one. 
if maybe Wolves figured we'd do well again, but it didn't happen. Uh, I don't know if there's really a player I want to beat up on. There's, I don't know. Josh Okogie's scoring efficiency has been pretty bad, but he had a nice three in this game. Only one, but it was a good, good shot, a good clutch play, good solid play. Just some of the, I don't know, some of the overly trigger happy stuff that drives me crazy. I guess I'm not going to really pick on one player over the course of this one. Again, just the injuries, the illness, it's getting ridiculous. I, I don't know what else to say. Uh, Jake Lehman with that toe injury. I can't believe it. It's ridiculous. But, well, welcome to the NBA, I guess. When guys get hurt, they don't really come back, uh, like in other sports, for whatever reason. I don't know if it's a pickiness thing or just the way the game is played, where in a lot of ways you do have to be super-duper healthy to, to, to really play at the top of your game. Like, you have a bad back. You're not going to be efficient out there. You're just going to be like, okay, yeah, okay, I missed that shot. And then you're not going to be as aggressive rebounding and this and that. Or a, a sore knee is the scariest thing ever. Watch the thing pop and then it's see, a, see you in a year and a half. That kind of nonsense. So, oh, God. I won't even think about it. Don't even go there, right? So with that said, we'll take a quick break, come back, preview three games. And then come back for segment number three, fan interaction. And, of course, some David Stern memory lane conversation. He's sick, he's hurt, he's sick, he's hurt, he's sick, he's hurt, he's sick, he's hurt. And we are back here on Timberwolves Explosion, segment number duh, number duh. Minnesota Timberwolves will be playing the Cleveland Cavaliers coming up. This has got to be in Cleveland, correct? Yes, sir. At Cleveland on the 5th. So a couple days off. This is not going to be till Sunday afternoon coming up. Then we play Memphis on Tuesday. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Henry McCoy. Hank McCoy. No, Wayne Hunt. Ah, <sighs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then we host the uh, Portland Trail Blazers. Keelan King and Tristan Mayer. Haven't heard from those guys in forever, but that's my own fault there. Yeah, that's my own fault. Just in case you're listening, <laughs> the Rip City Bad Boys podcast, give them a shout out. I haven't uh, interacted with them in forever, and I apologize for that. Uh, Cleveland Cavaliers coming to Target Center, and we just talked about the Cleveland Cavaliers, and it was a weak ass game and stuff. Will Kevin Love play? I don't know. Is Kevin Love going to get traded? I don't know. Probably because I know it's like the guys on the team are super young. Love is over thirty already, which is the weirdest thing ever. I gotta believe Kevin Love's over thirty. Isn't that weird? That's weird. Uh, is Carl ever going to come back from the knee sprain? Is Wiggins ever going to be healthy? I got a sneaky feeling he's got to be recovered by then. I mean, it's a lot of days off. Somebody's going to come back, right? Maybe the contusion, the way these are, the way my contusion's healing, it's got to be a bone bruise because regular ones, regular like muscle bruises, they usually heal in maybe two weeks or so. It's been about one week, and I'm telling you, nothing. It's not, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, I don't feel a whole lot of improvement. A little bit. Very slight. Slight, because there's muscle and, yeah, bone. So, let's leave that alone. I better stop talking about myself. That's selfish, man. Uh, yeah, not a whole lot of assists. They're kind of like a college team, aren't they? The Cleveland Cavaliers. They really are. Colin Sexton and this guy and that guy. Kevin Love. Is he going to be healthy? I don't know. I don't know what's going on with Kevin Love's health uh, of late. Uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers, the Charlotte Hornets. They recently played the Charlotte Hornets and lost to them. Isn't that great? That's a, that's wonderful. <laughs> recently lost to the Hornets on Jan 2nd. Let's go back to their uh, last five. 121-118 over the Atlanta Hawks right before Christmas there. Uh, lost to Boston by uh, 11 points. 129-117 beat the Wolves. 94-88, lame game. Uh, 117.97 loss to Toronto. Whew, that's harsh on New Year's Eve. And then the loss to the Hornets. Wow, loss to the Charlotte Hornets, 109-106. Charlotte's semi-knocking on the playoff door. That's pathetic, though. They're nine games under 500, and they're, well, you know, they're what? Uh, yeah, about two games out of eighth place in the in the Eastern Conference playoff standings. What was I going to get to? Oh, one other thing I forgot to mention in the first segment because I was talking about so many other things is... There's an alarming seesaw going on with the whole Carl Anthony Towns being in, being out. See, the Wolves' offense is way up there, one of the best in the league when Carl Anthony Towns is healthy. But their defense is dead last, right? Their defense has been pretty much dead last in the league with Carl Anthony Towns out there. 
And then Carl Anthony Towns goes out. The Wolves are like top five defensively in the league and dead last in offense. So <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. I mean, I, why is the defense so bad with Carl Anthony Towns? Is he that terrible? But it also does say how good Gorgie Zhang is defensively because Gorgie Zhang is the main guy replacing Carl in this stage. Gorgie Zhang needs more minutes. I'm, I'm sorry. Gorgie Zhang needs to be playing more often. If it's moving Carl to the four, leaving, uh, putting Gorgie at power forward and uh, sliding... Covington back to where he probably should be at three. I think he's a better defender at three than he is at the power forward. I do. I mean, then you have two guys who can hopefully block some shots, because when Carl does play defense, obviously he's got the length. He can block some shots. He can have some big moments. Gorgie Zhang's a very solid defender. He's not perfect, but he's very solid, man. I'm telling you. Uh, good rebounder, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to keep saying Gorgie Zhang should be either starting or getting major minutes at power forward or center in the future. Uh, I do not mind the idea of putting Carl at power forward because if he wants to shoot 9,000 threes, so be it. But then again, Gary Jeng's one of the best three-point shooters on the team too now. Uh, he didn't used to be, but he is now. He's got that silky smooth shot. We all love Nas Reed. We don't want to see his minutes completely uh, dissipate either. So, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I am I am more for having big players out there than just, than just playing small ball, small ball, small ball, small ball. You know, like... Culver at small forward, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, Okogi at small forward makes even less sense. Um, I don't know. It's kind of like make certain guys earn it, but I think Carl, when Carl's healthy again, which hopefully he is by this one, I don't know. Wiggins better be. I mean, come on. Though, of course, look at my my brother's family with the flu and all that. My God, this is the most ridiculous, awful Christmas holidays, whatever you want to call it, Christmas season ever. In terms of people being sick and like taking forever to heal, it's been ridiculous. Ridiculous. God bless you, Andrew Wiggins and others on the team uh, that have been sick. It's ridiculous. I'm pretty sure, yeah, that's where uh, what's his name has been. Uh, Trevion Graham. He's also been sick with the similar symptoms and such. It's utterly ridiculous, man. It's depressing. Uh, I hope he gets better. Yeah, and I, you know, I mean, I get it. I get it. It sucks. It sucks. Uh, it's probably the worst, sickest. Christmas season, New Year's season, uh, uh, in recent memory, probably in my lifetime, ridiculous. Heck, many years ago, back in 91, 92, I had the flu the whole time. That was depressing. But, you know, eh, you know, that, I, you know <laughs> that was back then. Let's just leave that alone. I don't want to talk about it, damn it. <laughs> it was icky, though. It was no fun. Um, Wolves offense is still ninth overall in the league, but dead last lately without Carl. And you can continue saying that. Cleveland Cavaliers, 27th in the league. You know, you notice they didn't score a whole lot of points against us the other day. Field goal percentage, no, re- rebounding Wolves are way ahead, but they got killed in the rebounds against Cleveland. Trist- Tristan Thompson beat us pretty good. Field goal percentage, both teams are in the lower part of the league. Wolves are way at the bottom, which is a bummer. Free throws doesn't really, I don't know. We're both in the lower third. Three-point percentage, we're near the bottom, unfortunately. Cleveland and Minnesota. So both teams not very good offensively. Even with Kevin Love, who used to be a three-point juggernaut, he hasn't been as much of late. Uh, but then again, he's missed a few games, missed five so far in the season. We'll see what happens. Uh, I don't know. I don't like the way the Wolves played against this club last time around. Hope to see a more inspired effort. Maybe Wiggins is back out there, which unfortunately means less minutes for certain people. But we'll see. I mean, if Shabazz Napier can be solid off the bench, so be it. Maybe Shabazz keeps starting. You move Culver to the bench. Uh, I don't think you can really move Culver to the bench, just the way things are going right now. I have no problem with Wiggins and Culver both starting together. Shabazz Napier gets like six-man roll, kind of something like that. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how things continue to change, especially when Carl comes back. Uh, what's going to happen with Nas Reed's minutes and, of course, uh, Gorgie Zheng's minutes? They both need to be playing, damn it. I mean, they both, all three of them need to be getting their major minutes. Carl, it's like common sense, this and that. I don't like the way the Wolves played against this team. I don't. It was pretty pathetic. Uh, but if they turn the ball over and such, Wolves need to capitalize. Like, just capitalize. It's like, you know, the Vikings. You fumble in the red zone or the, the goal. You know, you, you fumble and you get the ball in first and goal and you don't, get the, you don't get a touchdown. Come on, guys. Golden opportunity to open up games against people, teams like Green Bay, teams like San Diego Char- well, Los Angeles Chargers, Denver Broncos. I mean, turnovers that are just gimmies, and you don't get a touchdown out of it. And it's like everybody knew it was going to haunt the Vikings later on, and it did against Green Bay. And I don't know. Let's just leave that alone. Uh, but that's what the Wolves did last time. 28 turnovers, and you wind up with 88 points in the game. It just makes me sick. Uh, 
Cleveland's very, you know, uh, Cleveland's very young, very sloppy, uh, this and that. Definitely a talented team. A lot of people say better than their record. Obviously, they have a pretty good coach. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Beeline there. Uh, obviously, had a great career with Michigan. I kind of feel for him, though. I, leaving Michigan, boy, oh, boy, you're like, you know, I don't think they were on the verge of letting him go for Michigan. I don't think so. Not anywhere near it. And, oof, I don't know. Cleveland? Cleveland's not a very safe haven in this day and age. Even when you win a championship, you still get let go, like Tyron Lewis, this and that. So, I, I don't know. It's not a very safe haven, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, man, see, I'm talking too long here, and I apologize. Uh, Wolves need to beat this team. It's a game that needs to be won by the Minnesota Timberwolves. If Andrew Wiggins comes, if Andrew Wiggins comes back, I do think the Wolves actually can take this one. Uh, absolutely. And, I don't know. And it's not even because Andrew Wiggins is back. A lot of people think that would be a reason why we'd lose. Uh, maybe worse ball control, stupid shot attempts, or just missed shots. But if he's healthier and more focused than maybe he was in that last game against Sacramento, where maybe he was already kind of sick, he didn't. He looked very determined, though, which I appreciated. Uh, if he can be more focused, locked in, have a good jump shot going, uh, Jamal should be able to win the game. I think it's going to be low scoring, though, for the most part. Something along the likes of 98 to 94. Timberwolves end up getting the win. I hope Wiggins is back. Maybe he's going to get like 25, something like that. Kind of right around his, his average this year, which is a beautiful average. Shabazz Napier, hopefully again, continues his strong clutch play. You get another double-double from Gorgie Zhang. And again, you need a solid game from Covington without a doubt. I mean, you just need a good team effort here to get this win on the road against a team that's got talent. They're well coached, but you know, again, they're a mess. They're a young mess of players. Wolves need to take advantage of that and get the victory. I doubt Carl will be back, but Wyatt Wiggins, hopefully, I, at this point, I he, he better be that type of thing. So let's move on quickly. I apologize for going on a little too long there. I get kind of wordy. I enjoy doing the show, though. That's part of it, obviously. Memphis Grizzlies. Oh, God, I could go on for days now, the way this has been going. Min- Minnesota versus Memphis. <laughs> I don't like this matchup. I don't like this matchup. Damn it. I don't like this matchup, Wayne Hunt. They already won the season series. Eh, they're gonna. They're gonna win the season series. It's gonna go to Memphis. Uh, so, Wolves will beat Cleveland, but we're not gonna beat Memphis. We don't beat these guys. I, I, I don't know what it is. Obviously, good, talented group of players. You got your John Morant. You got this guy. You got that guy. It's a talented team. They're just not ready for the big time as far as I'm concerned, but they're very efficient offensively. Their win-loss record is not good yet, but again, very efficient. High field goal percentage, three point percentages in the middle. Uh, above average offense, generally speaking, right in the middle with the rebounding. Solid. Good, solid group of players. Valence Junis getting about 10 rebounds a game. Jay Crowder, who can hit some threes and get some rebounds. Good, solid player. John Morant, when healthy, has been fantastic. He's missed a couple games, but generally speaking, he's been very, uh, a very solid, strong rookie, and he should be. He was the number two pick in the draft. Uh, got star potential all over him. Jaron Jackson Jr. has been very strong. They can act, they can hit their threes, boy. They really can. Uh, John Morant's about forty one percent already. That's impressive for a rookie. You know, you don't always get that. Uh, a guy I've been hearing people complain about. Oh, of course, especially Mister. Uh, yeah, I forget where it was. It might have been on Timberwolves Explosion page. I think it was. I might get to that in fan interaction, but uh, one way or another, if it wasn't there, if it was on the uh, courtside page, Tyus Jones. Yeah, he's not been good. Yeah, it, it was on the courtside page. Uh, Wayne Hunt very frustrated with Tyus Jones. He's not had a good year for Memphis. Uh, he's mediocre from downtown, mediocre field goal percentage, even pretty lame for a, for a free uh, for a point guard, 75% free throw percentage. He's not been good in Memphis. Uh, I think he was so used to being here, being at home and everything. You get the money, but now you're now you're in a different place and the pressure's different. The vibe is different. It's just a whole new world. Uh, Tyus Jones, I mean, he played Duke and he did well there. But that was just one year and it was freaking Duke. I mean, you know, Memphis is a little different and you got... A guy, talking of Duke, uh, John Morant has been a spectacular player for them. Tyus Jones isn't going to be getting any limelight or anything. Uh, he's not a starting point guard in the NBA, and uh, I can understand the frustration from uh, Wayne Hunt uh, paying all that money, and the guy's not, not doing that well there. A weird, uh, weird new situation for him. Uh, Jay Crowder was a good three-point shooter lately, not this year for Memphis. Uh, Grayson Allen can hit the three. You know, you could go on forever there. He's one of those chippy players, but he's a really sharp shooter. 
He's kind of like a very poor man's John Stockton, in a way. Not with a spectacular getting assist, 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 but kind of a chippy player who can shoot. That's kind of where I see Grayson Allen. He's got a little little, little bit of Stockton in him, a little bit. You know, the chippiness and the and the sharp shooting, this and that, where Stockton could obviously hit shots, you know, uh, regularly, regular basis, very smooth game. Uh, Dylan Brooks, again, one of those diamonds in the rough, who's emerged very nicely for the uh, Memphis Grizzlies. Certainly rough around the edges, not great field goal percentage, this and that, but he's had some huge games, and he had a huge game against us. Most recently, I think the Memphis Grizzlies defeat the Minnesota Timberwolves. <sighs> I don't like it. I hate this matchup. It's a totally different team now. It's not like a you know eighty you know ninety to eighty eight type of game anymore, like it was in the uh, Market Soul days. Minnesota versus Market Soul, blah blah blah. Where it was always low scoring, and we'd always always lose against them. It's going to be high scoring. Uh, I think the. Uh, Memphis Grizzlies score something along the likes, depending on if Carl's back, I guess, with the offense-defense thing. I, I don't know. I'm gonna, not going to count on Carl coming back. I'm just not counting on it. If he does, he does. So let's just leave it as is. I got frustrated. I keep talking, oh, Carl's going to get 30 points in this game, and he's, he's not even back for like the whole week. So it's like, whatever. Wiggins, I'm guessing, will be back. Maybe Trevion Graham will be back, but I think Memphis is going to get like 122, 100 and. 18. They're still going to score, just not 137 or anything, but it's going to still be high. 118 to 110, 118 to 108, 102, something like that. I think the Grizzlies are going to beat the Wolves uh, by 10 points, so 118, 108 at the end of the day. Oh, man. Got to get something out of Culver, Covington, whoever it is, but I just think Memphis is going to win the game. Um, we just need the Wolves to play a significantly different type of game to beat this team. I, I, I don't know, I don't know what to say anymore. Uh, Memphis is two out of their last five. So they lost to San Antonio. They beat the, wow, they have 145 points to the Spurs. Whew. They beat Oklahoma City. Wow. Huh. They beat them badly too by 13. That's impressive. Lose to Denver by nine. Beat Charlotte by a lot, 13. And get crushed, no, get beat by Sacramento, giving up 128 points though. In stack though. Interesting. Well, that must have been a fun game on Jan 2nd entertaining back-and-forth battle. Probably a lot more efficient than the game the Wolves played on December 26th. <laughs> that was pretty clunky. Uh, <laughs> but we finally ended a losing streak. That's I mean, yeah, That matters for something. But I just think Memphis is going to beat us. I'm not liking this matchup. I, it, if it's Paul Gasol, John Morant, Dylan Brooks, whatever it is, I just think the Memphis Grizzlies beat the Wolves. I'm just going to move on. I, ugh, yuck. Portland's never been a good matchup for us either, but it's better at home. Uh, the Wolves never beat Portland in Portland. Like, never, ever, 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 ever. Only once in a blue moon. Jan the 9th, moving on here. Boy, I can't believe much time has elapsed. But again, I've had a lot to say today for some reason. Uh, Damian Lillard, yeah, yeah, we're happy for him. I'm tired of Damian Lillard. But uh, Portland, Portland's always going to be a pain in the ass to play against. We've only played one game this year so far. So Jan the 9th, March 17th, and then... Uh, Yep, yeah, March 17th. And then March 22nd, just about a week later there, Minnesota Timberwolfies will be uh, hosting the Trailblazers. So it's uh, home away home the rest of the way, which makes a lot of sense. Obviously, you can see your division rival here in the Northwest Division. They're fourth, we're fifth. We're actually only one game behind, or a half game behind the Blazers. So Blazers are starting to stink again for some reason after a strong run there. Horrible start to the season. Now they're losing like crazy again. They lost all their last five. Lost by eight to New Orleans. Lost by seven. No, six to Utah. Beat by only eight against the Lakers, but it was a home game for Portland. Couldn't beat Phoenix. Lose by six at home as well. And then the New York Knicks on New Year's Day. It's a new year for New York. Whew, boy. 117.93. Whew. <laughs> Ah, uh, okay. Well, I mean, the Wolves hung in there pretty nicely last time around. Uh, this has got to be a win for the Timberwolves, right? You want to feel the positive eye. Maybe Carl does finally come back. Hopefully, at this point, I hope so. Wiggins has had some good games against Portland. He certainly has over the years. I expect Wiggins to be the leading scorer in this one for sure. Against Memphis, I have no freaking idea. I mean, I have enough. I, I got a sneaky feeling if the Wolves win the game, it's going to have to do with Culver and Napier. I just got a feeling. Wiggins did have 33 against the Blazers. It wasn't the most efficient game, but it was. It wasn't bad. I mean, he's four or six from downtown. The turnovers were not good. The blocks were good. Turnovers ended up killing us down the stretch in that one. Uh, a couple of weeks back, but Portland was pretty strong then. They yeah, they've lost every game since then. They have lost every game since then. They still have only 14 wins. So. Portland has lost uh, 
How many in a row since? They've lost, well, five in a row. Yeah, it, it is exactly five. Okay, I thought it was more. Nope, 16 losses, now 21 at this stage. So, well, hopefully the Wolves can keep these guys losing. And that would be helpful at the end of the day. Who will they be playing between now and then? The Wizards, the, the Heat, the Toronto Raptors. It's a huge road trip, and that's where the, we're the end of the road trip. I think the Wolves are going to beat the Portland Trailblazers. Maybe they'll have a huge losing streak. Maybe they'll beat Washington, eh, Miami, and Toronto. I think those are both losses. So, unfortunately, don't be surprised. Portland comes out like, we got to beat somebody. we got to beat the Wolves. But we'll see. I hope they don't. Wolves need to take care of business in Target Center, even though we haven't been the best home team this year. Uh, I'm hoping Carl comes back, but I do believe Andrew Wiggins will put in a very, very, very nice effort. Uh, this game could go either way. For me, it's 50-50. It's like a pick em. But I'll be uh, generous and pick the Wolves to beat the Portland Trail Blazers by one point. One. One point. We're talking 113, 112, 114, 113, 115, one, you know, you get the idea. We're going to go in the teens, basically. The Wolves win by one point. Andrew Wiggins is going to get in the low 30s. Uh, Got to get a better average from Covington than the last time around. But Gorgie, yeah, he had a huge game. Poor efficiency, but some nice threes. Shabazz Napier was. Uh, was all right, but the turnover ratio again, crap. Uh, Okogi, I don't want him starting. He didn't do crap in that game. I'd rather have Culver. I'll take my chances with Jared Culver versus Okogi in the game, depending on who was the other guard. If it's Napier starting at guard, uh, Wiggins at small forward, coming to power forward, whatever it is. But Wiggins is a very good small forward uh, at the end of the day. I'm comfortable with that uh, long term, depending on how things go. That was especially if you move Covington to small forward, you could put Wiggins back to guard, and then Culver started point guard, and so on and so forth, depending on what the uh, future holds in the NBA draft and the uh, and free agency and trade deadline. Who's going to move where? But uh, that's right, one Gorgie Jank possibly starting a power forward or center. You know, and Carl plays the other position of the two, basically. Jeff T continues his river, uh, reserve role, so to speak. $19 million off the books, though, so that's a nice... Uh, you know, expiring contract for the Wolves long term. But I do believe the Wolves win by one point over the Portland Trailblazers and Wiggins leads the way. With that, we'll take a quick break. Yeah, this show's probably going to go a little bit over an, an hour, it looks like, this time around. Maybe an maybe hour and 15 minutes, possibly. So with that, we'll take a break and uh, head into fan interaction. We are back here on Timberwolves Explosion Fan Interaction Segment. I guess there was something from uh, Wayne Hunt in the Facebook page, but we'll go to Twitter first, at Wolves Explosion, at Wolves Explosion. want to thank 10A Brown, Levi Brown, and Vinrock Vinstermano of the Courtside Podcast for retweeting the most recent episode, episode 269, Newark Basketball, because it was Brick City. This and that. So, uh, awesome. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for retweeting the show and passing it on to your friends. Got a little interaction up here as we keep moving forward. Uh, frustrations, yep, and thanks Vin, Vinrock Vince Germano for retweeting the uh, Purple Mafia show last week too. Wild Card Weekend Preview. Pretty cool. Viking fans, check out Purple Mafia. That's a Vikings podcast. Uh, yeah, Vinrock was frustrated. He was saying, it's been a whole, a whole day and I'm still flat over the Browns. I've just got this terrible feeling. We are going to lose some good players and start yet another rebuild. That would be terrible. Yeah, I feel the same about the Wolves lately. Uh, uh, Oh, uh, 10A Brown and NBA Polls liked a uh, photo from Kobe Bryant. He said, the game changed in so many ways under David Stern's leadership and vision. He demanded the best of everyone because he gave it himself. Hashtag respect. Thank you, Commissioner R.I.P. So very cool there. Vinrock, Vince Germano also saying, rest in peace, David Stern. This is all on New Year's Day, so he never really got to see 2020, at least as a mortal soul, so to speak. Uh, so we'll move forward. Uh, get back to David Stern very shortly. Tanae Brown out of New Zealand. He says, Robert Covington kind of reminds me of poor man's Andre Kirilenko. I could see that a little bit. Yeah, that's de- very defensive, power small forward type of guy who can hit some threes, this and that. I can see it. And, you know, like I kept saying, uh, Nas Reed reminds me of Sam Perkins. It's fun when you can make comparisons like that. I can see that a bit. I can. Uh, not a bad comparison today. 
Uh, Levi Brown posts this, not a big fan of Napier, and uh, I haven't been either, believe me. Uh, but he was he was awesome this week, wasn't he? Um, so he had posted a uh, Star Tribune article here, did uh, Levi Brown on Twitter. He says, not a big fan of Napier, but he was great this week. I also would like Gorgie to start, although he had a quieter week. He plays much better as a starter and performs, and he performs his role well. This was a great quote from G. Um, Gorgi Zhang hopes more talented teammates jump on Timberwolves. Yep, I'll come back. Yeah, I better look that up here in a second. So, uh, no, I, I'm totally on board with Gorgi Zhang starting. I'm completely in agreement with everything you said there, basically. I've not been a fan of Napier either, uh, but he had an awesome week. And, of course, Gorgi Zhang, awesome. Uh, he's been awesome. And I, he's a completely different player when he's starting. I mean, you look at his splits over the years, like when he's a backup, he averages like three points a game, three rebounds. It's ridiculous. He's a starter, and he's, he's like a double-double guy. So, to me, it's common sense. He needs to start, or he's not, you know, not worth anything, sadly, at the end of the day. So, here we go. Uh, quote is, hopefully they can see how hard we play, and when they get back, they can just jump on the train. If If you have your top players, they see how hard we play when we're limited, and when they come back, they should do even better because they're talented. We don't have the talent they have. They're way talented. They're way better basketball players. So hopefully, when they get back, they can give us some energy. And uh, that's cool. Very cool from Gorgie. So, yep, a little bit of leadership there involved as well, I got to think. That's uh, that's awesome. Um, love what you had to say there, Levi Brown. Yeah, and uh, passing that on to me. Um, that was, again, in the article, Star Tribune article. I didn't, I didn't cite the... Uh, the writer. I apologize. I'm going to go back really quick and check that out. Oh, come on now. Uh, Chris Hine. Okay, yep. Chris Hine is the uh, the Wolves beat there. The blog, the Wolves beat. So, yep. Chris Hine cited Star Tribune with a Wolves beat. Awesome. Uh, great quote. Great quote, Gorgie Zhang. Yeah, I mean, come back and let's go. Jump on the train. Let's not just, let, okay, now we're just going to go right back where we were, losing games and, you know, and oh, and you guys can just kind of, you know, sit on the bench and be quiet. Well, we'll just do our thing. No, everybody jump on board. Let's roll and maybe we can actually get back in the playoff hunt again. It's, it's, if San Antonio, put it this way, if San Antonio is the eighth seed right now, we're not that far behind. You know, because San Antonio is not the good uh, good team anymore. They're not good anymore. Let's just leave that as this. Ooh, yep. And today, uh, excuse me, Vinrock Vince Germano retweeted uh, Brave the Wild. Cool. Episode 222, Freeze the Puck. Check out Brave the Wild if you could as well, if you're a hockey fan out there. Those of you, thank you very much. Vinrock Vince Germano, uh, Vinrock Vince Germano and Wayne Hunt, along with Stu Benson, the hosts of the Courtside Podcast. Wayne Hunt's kind of the alpha dog there. He's the lead host. Basically what I do for this show. But uh, imagine me and then two, two guys joining in and... Uh, forming a, a triangle of awesome basketball conversation. Uh, Wayne Hunt is from Sydney, Australia. Vinrock Vince Germano from Melbourne, Australia. And Stu Benson also from Sydney, Australia. Love those guys. Awesome show. Couple of Laker fans and a Memphis fan in Wayne Hunt. Uh, they don't just favor their team the whole time. They talk about everything. They're going to talk about David Stern, that's for sure, next time they're on the air. That's a given. And all over the league, you know, Greek freak, whoever, LeBron James. Uh, whatever it is, top stories throughout the league, and you know, and then some little banter back and forth about their own teams, especially when they play each other. So maybe a little bit of little little bit of Jared Culver style trash talking, right? Nothing too harsh, I, I would hope. Anyway, uh, th- they won't have to worry about getting a technical foul either, because yeah, there's no ref watching, uh, listening to uh, their conversation. Okay, Wayne Hunt, Facebook.com forward slash Timberwolves Explosion, Facebook.com forward slash Timberwolves Explosion. So this is the only comment here, but it developed a conversation here. Wayne Hunt, well, Timberwolves fans are going to get upset, but it is what it is. Or Tyus fans. He says, Tyus Jones is whack. Prove me wrong. Total buyer's remorse. What does this kid do again? Well, he hit some shots for us. Um, He hit some shots for us, and he was adequate. You know, I liked what he did last year, but I don't know. Like I was saying earlier, when we were talking about Memphis, he, you know, other than playing that one year in Duke, where obviously it was a really good situation, great coach, great program, blah, 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 you could go on forever. They they won it all. Um, and then, you know, he, now for the first time, he's he's legitimately leaving Minnesota for an extended period of time, maybe for the rest of his career. It's a weird situation, and he's playing behind a, uh, a star, star rookie, a future star in the league. It's a tough situation. We're here in Minnesota. 
I mean, he was a significant player. Uh, he could start, he could back up, he could do this and that. He could hit threes. He was a good, solid leader. Unbelievable assist to turnover ratio. So he did a lot of that. But um, it, it's crazy. So here's Wayne Hunt again, continuing saying, plenty of people were pushing for this kid to run the team in mini. But let me tell you, he's not a starter. Shit, he's barely a backup. His numbers are terrible. He was different here. He was different here. He wasn't great. He was never a great player. That's that's a given, but he was very solid. Uh, his assist-to-turnover ratio was the best in the league. Notice how I've been complaining nonstop about Shabazz Napier's assist-to-turnover ratio. But Napier's a better offensive player than Tyus Jones. I'm going to grant you that right away. Uh, but Tyus Jones is a better floor general. He's a better, you know, he's better at protecting the basketball. He's better at g- guiding the offense, we'll say without being a legit scorer. Uh, but this year, yes, of course. But uh, Tyus Jones is a totally different player for Memphis, and I, I understand your frustration, Wayne. I'm not going to be totally against you there. Ah, oh, shoot, I just pushed it away. Okay, so Wayne Hunt, or excuse me, Vince Germano responds with, stop it, stop it. <laughs> Wayne Hunt responds with, horrible. Vince Germano says, I thought he'd be playing pretty well. Wayne Hunt says, six rebounds, one point, four assist average a game, get the bleep out of here. <laughs> Vince Romano says, he's a backup, man. And Wayne Hunt responds with, and there have been games where he has been outright terrible. Well, I could definitely say the same about Napier. There have been games he's been outright terrible. And it's for different reasons. Because, you know, see, again, four assists. I mean, okay, yeah, he's a backup. He's not going to get a ton of assists. He's only averaging, what, 19 minutes a game? Something like that, right? Like we were seeing about 19, 20 minutes a game. <sighs> yeah, he he's not a standout player, but... Again, he protected the basketball. It, it was a different vibe here. Uh, too bad Flip Saunders never even got to coach the guy. No, you never got a chance. He was going to, and he, he, he died. You know, I mean, Flip Saunders was going to coach him, and he died. It, it, uh, <laughs> the more I think about that, I just get sad. You know, terrible, terrible story, man. Uh, it's like, what, what the hell can you do? You know, I mean, what, what the hell can you do? It's just one of those things. Um, where is Tyus Jones? Where is he? Where's the son of a gun? Come on, he's right here, right? There he is, Tyus Jones. Yeah, I mean, weak numbers. I get it. I get it. Believe me, nine million a year, though. Yeah, that's what I don't like about the NBA. Nine million a year. Do you know what Tyus Jones would be if he was a hockey player? He'd be a perennial All Star at nine million a year in the NHL. In the NHL, nine million a year. You're an All Star every freaking year. I mean, you're the best. You're one of the best players in the league. NBA, yeah, that's what I don't like about the NBA. It's just, like, too much, you know, too much money. Stu Benson, yep, so it's the whole court side joining on here. Isn't that cool? Stu Benson, Sydney responds with, he'll be a decent backup, but you've got to be a pretty special, you've got to be pretty special to excel at the L. I mean, in the, in the, in the L. So I guess I'm guessing he's saying in the league at 5'11". His kid brother has a higher ceiling. Yep, that's the other one in Duke there. Wayne Hunt says, we could have got more for less money. I agree with that. That's why the Wolves didn't keep him. Um, 9.3 million is too much. There wasn't a whole lot of complaining in this town. It's sad to see him go. Now, certain super loyal Tyus Jones fans in this town are like, no, get the bleep out of here. How could he leave? You know, you what kind of general manager is Gerson Rosas? And, well, I mean, <sighs> you know what's funny? The assist numbers are exactly the same. And the turnover ratio is outstanding. I mean, like 5 to 1, so I wouldn't complain about that, Wayne or whoever else. It might be in, in the Memphis fan base. Three-point percentage is about the same. It's like 1% lower than his career average. Field goal percentage is 1% higher than his career average. Um, I, I understand he doesn't stand out, but the money, yeah. I mean, the money's frustrating, but again, only one turnover a game. Only one. That's good. Uh, he was the best of the league last year. 4.8 assists, 0.7 turnovers. 4.8 assists in 19.4 in my 19 and a half minutes. That's not that bad. That's not that bad. Only one turnover. I mean, you look, let's look at Shabazz, eh? Shabazz Napier, who was, you know, I, you know, like I guess their draft position was pretty similar, like the lower third of the first half. See, now this show's gonna be really long, but it is what it is. You know, I mean, we're having a. Why did I even click on that stupid button when I had it right in front of me already? But. uh I mean, Napier, does he protect the ball? No. <laughs> Napier does not protect the basketball. He's averaging four assists a game. I'm surprised it's even that high. Four assists to two turnovers. See, I mean, it's twice as many turnovers and actually one less assist in comparison. So, 
I don't know. I mean, Shabazz, I love what he does. His field goal percentage is actually lower than Tyus's. His sweeper percentage is actually lower than Tyus's. Free throw percentage is 6% higher. So, uh, so you know, I mean, obviously, the money, though. I, I get it. See, when you talk about less for more, Shabazz Napier's contract, this is where you'll box me in, like, one second. $1.8 million. $1.8.5, I guess we'll say, million. $1.85 million. So, yeah, you'd get me in a box there. The money is the number one complaint there, and I, I agree with that part 100%. It's just that, you know, I mean, 5-1 to one assist ratio is pretty good. It's pretty good, where this one, it's literally 2-1 to one with, with Shabazz. That's a big freaking difference, so... 5-1 to one versus 2-1. to one. Oof, I mean, that's a big difference, so... I mean, that that's my one thing. I like protecting the basketball... But give it up to Shabazz for being more aggressive. Uh, Tyus, very conservative. Very, very conservative. So that might frustrate the hell out of you when you have a star player. But you already have John Morant. So you got a future there with your point guard position. So, I mean, I understand the, the money, though. He's, you know, that's where Troy Hudson drove us nuts. We were paying him, what, like years ago, 10 years ago when the salary cap wasn't nearly as high. We were paying him, what, $6.5 million or something for that schmuck. I mean, Tyus Jones, or excuse me, Troy Hudson with an idiot, you know, you talk about reckless and just low IQ basketball. That idiot. I mean, and I know some of you love T-Hud, but I, I didn't. Marcus Forecaster did not like Troy Hudson. We got sick of that guy. He had the stupid idiot shot attempts, game in, game out. It drove us absolutely up the wall. So now we'll wrap things up with uh, Commissioner David Stern. And again, I knew this show was going to be longer. It's already over an hour, and I haven't even gotten to David Stern and memory lane and this and that. So there's a lot to talk about with Stern I'm, uh, in just a few minutes here. I'll try to cram in a lot of information in a few minutes as best I can. So, of course, yes, he started back in 84 as the commissioner. He came into the league apparently in 1970 as kind of a you know an outside attorney, became more of an inside attorney. I mean, almost all these big shots, they're, they're lawyers. Like every politician's a lawyer. It's either some gigantic business tycoon or a lawyer. And uh, that's basically what this guy was. He's a lawyer. Uh, he's got the ego of a lawyer. <laughs> That's for sure. He certainly had an ego. And again, like I said earlier, I saw him in person with Leah B. Olson. Of course, there's like a natural ego there, but he was entertaining. He had a sense of humor. Uh, he was he was kind of funny. Um, and of course, the word he likes to use nonstop is globalize, globalize, globalize. Sometimes that word scares me a little bit, but sometimes it's like, okay, uh, when it comes to your business, globalizing your business, I get that 100%. Of course, you're maximizing profitability, you're maximizing marketability, and that's common sense. When you have a guy like Michael Jordan, and again, he got lucky in terms of Michael Jordan came in the league with him as the commissioner, like, okay, oh, well, anybody can succeed to Michael Jordan. But this man amplified everything Michael Jordan was. Uh, he made sure that Michael Jordan was marketed more than any other player. He made sure that Michael Jordan was protected more than any other player. And Michael Jordan is worth almost $2 billion today. So Michael Jordan owes uh, David Stern a hell of a lot of credit, and I'm sure he will. I haven't seen a quote, but I'm sure it's out there. I wish I had it. You know, I should almost look that up here in the <laughs> background. Magic Johnson did say that he owes him his life, though. Uh, Magic Johnson, uh, you know, uh, when, when Magic Johnson came out with uh, the whole... You know, obviously the HIV came out. Yeah, $1.9 billion for Michael. That's just unbelievable. That's unbelievable. But uh, let's see if there's any quotes. Michael Jordan reacts. I'm going to kind of pick this up here if I can. Um, it's in here somewhere. But no, I'm, I mean, when, when uh, Magic Johnson had uh, been uh, diagnosed with HIV... David Stern didn't run away from him and basically say, yeah, well, you know, we're, we're not going to get involved with this guy anymore. Because, you know, some people, they just tend to disappear sometimes. Like Magic Johnson would have disappeared from the NBA, possibly. But uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, <laughs> I got to get to Michael, man. But, uh, yeah, but Magic, of course. Mr. David Stern kept bringing him in, uh, kept him around, the All-Star game, this and that, back in 92. I watched that whole game live back then. Not in person, but in Orlando. It was a great game, great effort. He was the MVP, and David Stern did not push him away, and the players didn't push him away. It was pretty cool. Uh, HIV is not a good thing. It's, it's a shame that it happened, but everybody makes mistakes and all that. And uh, Magic's, you know, obviously a very marketable, very 
a very nice guy, big smile. You know, he's got the billion, billion dollar smile, not million dollar smile. He's got a billion dollar smile, kind of like Michael, but even better, actually. Um, so why you would push him away would have been a huge mistake, I think. And David Stern did a hell of a job there. And Magic uh, credited him so much. Uh, David Stern, though, again, I mean, the, the uh, marketing, Michael Jordan, uh, the way he did. Again, I mean, Michael Jordan's worth $1.9 billion. He's the full owner of the Charlotte Hornets because he, he there was times it's like he's, he's a partial owner. He's just a partial owner, but he wants uh, control, blah, blah, blah. Well, he owns the Hornets, like major, like 90% of the Hornets. His value is insane. And, of course, the TV contract helped as well. And who got the TV contract going? It was Stern, of course. And then, uh, you know, it was Stern. And then... Uh, Adam Silver's done a hell of a job in, in his stead. I don't agree with every single thing David Stern and Adam, Adam Silver have done, especially politically. I'm not, you know, 100% agreement with every political thing they say or do, but that's life. You know, that's life. We're not going to agree with every political thing. We're not going to agree with every business decision people make. We're not going to agree with this. We're not going to agree with that. Um, I agree with some of it, not everything. And maybe certain things I agree with. Part, I partially agree, partially disagree because there's, every decision that's being made as big as these guys make, there's so many tentacles to these decisions. You can't agree with every single aspect of it. You can't agree with every single way they came to the decision. You can't agree with the way the information got to them either. I can't agree with everything. Uh, let's just, I'm just putting that as is, but uh, it's extremely, uh, extremely deep, extremely, vi- <laughs> extremely vast. Uh, and, but David Stern has made so many good decisions for the NBA so it's uh, pretty cool to imagine, uh, pretty pretty cool to uh, respect what he's done over the course of many years. I'm trying to see if this is Michael or not. And uh, here is the Michael Jordan. It's, it's from his manager, so to speak. But uh, without David Stern, the NBA would not be what it is today. He guided the league. Uh, uh, he guided the league through turbulent times and grew the league into an international phenomenon, creating opportunities that were that few could have imagined before. His vision and leadership provided me with the global stage that allowed me to succeed. David had a deep love for the game of basketball and demanded excellence from those around him, and I admired him for that. I wouldn't be where I am without him. I offer my deepest sympathies to Diane and his family. Michael Jordan. So cool. Thank you for passing that on. S.D. Portnoy. Hashtag, or uh, at S.D. Two E's there. So that's a Twitter account given the site there. I don't want to just steal people's stuff and just say, ah, I, I got it. No, obviously I didn't get it. I don't know Michael Jordan or his manager. So <laughs> I wish I knew Michael Jordan and his manager, but I don't. Um, Charlotte Hornets, of course, uh, love the name change. Um, so now we'll, we'll get to some Timberwolves, David Stern relations here. Of course, obviously, you know, they approved. He, he was the, the commissioner when the Timberwolves came in the NBA in 1989, officially, officially got approved in 87. We were going to be the Wolves or the Polars and ended up being the Timberwolves. So that's good. Good choice there. Even though Polars is cool. If you like Minneapolis North, I guess, but you already got Minneapolis North. Let's have the, the Wolves, Timberwolves, more unique, I guess, in that sense. Um, cause there's not a whole lot of Timberwolves names out there. In fact, we're the only team with that name that I can think of other than uh hardwood floor company out there. Uh, that I saw locally here in the neighborhood. Pretty cool. <laughs> right here in the neighborhood. Isn't that cool? Golden Valley, Minnesota, Duluth street, Douglas, Olympia, you know, those streets might be familiar to some of you out there that, uh, that, uh, might live somewhere near Golden Valley. Um, so Timberwolves related, of course, again, came in the league in 89, blah, blah, blah. And then there was uh, Harvin Marv selling the team. Harvin Marv screwed everything up for both teams, frankly. Uh, they were good owners. They got everything started. All the respect in the world. But they, Harv and Marv prevented the Minnesota North Stars moving into the Target Center. It was complete crap. They were just too stubborn. To, to budge on any type of deal. And of course, Norm Green was a jackass too. So it was two jackasses being jackasses. So no target center for the North Stars. Next thing you know, they became the Dallas Stars. And then a year bleeping later, Marvin Harvard like, ah, oh, we're selling the team. And it was through a group in New Orleans. So thanks, Harvin Marv. You almost cost us two freaking teams. We would have had nothing in the winter. It would have been cold Omaha for crying out loud for us. Could you imagine? No Timberwolves, no North Stars. As uh, there was all kinds of conversation. The sale was made. It was pending league approval. They were already talking about a new team name, possibly in New Orleans. Or, I mean, because they would have probably changed it at some time. There was like Red Wolves. That was the only one I remember hearing. It was on the radio show in New Orleans. And then 
David Stern was like, nah. and then Arnie Carlson, of course, Arnie Carlson, the governor of Minnesota at the time, uh, went after like, hey, you know, don't let this happen, blah, 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 basically. And David Stern was like, yeah, I don't know if this is a good idea. And then the, the, the NBA Board of Governors voted unanimously against it, which they were like, what? what, what? Like New Orleans couldn't believe it. And then uh, the knight in shining armor, Glenn Taylor, came and where everybody wants to claim, uh, compare, complain and bash Glenn Taylor, he saved the franchise. He kept Kevin Garnett here, blah, blah, blah. He gave him uh, more money than most owners would have at the time. It was the contract that caused the NBA lockout. So there's that. Uh, thank you, David Stern, there for preventing us from moving away. And, of course, Glenn Taylor working together in that one, keeping the Timberwolves in Minnesota. That's why they're still here all these years later, 25 years later now, 25, 20, almost 26 years later. We're talking 1994. As bad as the Wolves were right after that, because they were terrible that next year. It was just nothing to get excited about. But it's like, hey, we're lucky to have them. We're lucky to have them. And again, David Stern was a part of that. And then you have the Joe Smith fiasco, the wink, wink to ink, ink, as Steve Ashburner once said. (laughs) Wink, wink to ink, ink. He used to be the Timberwolves beat writer. Now he's been working for NBA.com for many years. Uh, Great writer, Steve Ashburner. Big times. You know, wonderful writer for the NBA. So much knowledge, man. That guy's an encyclopedia. I'd like to meet that guy, Steve Ashburner. Out of all the Wolves columnists over the years, that's the guy I'd like to meet by far. I uh, love that guy. Um, I mean all of them. You know, that's the one I'd want to meet if I could pick one. Um, but the wink, wink to ink, ink, uh, when it was turned out that it was a, you know, it was a secret contract, illegal contract, that was guaranteeing Joe Smith this amount of money or that amount of money, this and that. It was a secret contract that, you know, is illegal. Uh, You can't do that. Uh, It was against the cap. Obviously, it was invisible because that's why it was a one-year deal every year, but secretly it was a long contract. It was just a wink, wink, ink, ink. It was like a, a paper handshake where there's a secret handshake where you just keep your mouth shut and don't write anything down. But when you put it in writing, and then Eric Fleischer, when uh, Joe Smith fired Eric Fleischer, Eric Fleischer said, hey, look at this. Uh-huh. Look at this contract. So you're, you're going to screw me over. I'm going to screw you over. That's basically what happened. And um, next thing you know, David Stern put down the hammer like we've never seen ever before. You think three first-round picks, two first-round picks? No, five. Five first-round picks. And everybody's like, wow, David Stern's going to be that harsh? And he's like, basically like, yeah, if you're going to do stuff like this, this is the kind of punishment we're going to set a precedent here. Glenn Taylor was fined a uh, million dollars. Kevin McHale and Glenn Taylor were suspended for a calendar year, which was crazy. So Flip Saunders was basically the Timberwolves 100%, which you could have said he was during the time he came back as president of basketball. He was awesome. Uh, there were no moves made because there was probably a whole lot of nudge, nudge, don't do anything, this and that. Some people would joke and say, maybe <laughs> when you consider the draft picks we took that with the, play, with the uh, picks we got back, because eventually we got two picks back. But a lot of people would joke about five first-round picks, well, that's just five picks that Kevin McHale won't screw up, so he's preventing us from having McHale screw up some more draft picks. You know, Paul Bleepin' Grant, who played three games, and Nesterovich was just okay. He was okay, you know. But then, the two picks you got, when you when he came, when we were able to get a couple, you know, he granted us some, uh, I forget what the word is, like an amnesty or whatever the heck the word is. He, he was, you know, granting us some forgiveness. He gave us two draft picks. And the first one of the two, because you had the 2004 and then eventually, no, 2003, and then 2004 was still like suspended or like taken away. And 2005, we got it back. Uh, when you consider the third one though, 2003, who we took, Indy freaking Yibi. It's like, yeah, you basically might as well have, that pick basically never existed anyway. And then Rashad McCants, some of you liked him, I didn't. I liked him at the very beginning in his rookie year, but right after that, Oh, what a jackass. Oh, my God. And apparently there was a lot of behind-the-scenes thing. What a jackass that guy really was. Um, But I guess he's a poet, according to Marcus Forecaster, where years later he became maybe a nicer guy. I don't know, poet. That's kind of weird. I I, I guess. I guess he's a poet. We're happy for him. Um, That's great. Uh, But the guy would, you know, talk about shooting too much, this and that. So, uh, but back to David Stern. (laughs) <laughs> that, that was a big historical thing right there where people were mad at David Stern for that, that uh, you know, punishment that was levied. But, well, get mad at Taylor and McHale for doing that contract. That was a stupid contract. And then we had to bring in back Joe Smith anyway, which is funny, after uh, 
Uh, Stern took away his uh, Larry Bird rights. I still remember all that so well. Circa 2001, 19 years ago, uh, early 2001. It was like, nope, you're, you're all screwed now. That was a crazy situation. Uh, very crazy at the end of the day. Um, or was that 02? It was a while ago. It was like 01, 02, something like that. Um, I think it was late 01. Yeah, late 01. And then, uh, yeah, he came back in the summer of 02, if I remember correctly. Fascinating stuff, right? <laughs> Joe Smith. Ah, man. But uh, interesting, fascinating stuff. David Stern kept things going. Multiple lockouts, 1999. It was a risky move in 99. Uh, and even tougher relations going on in 2011. But the uh, deal they ended up hammering out ended up being very profitable for both sides. Basketball-related income. The players are making bajillions now. And, of course, the great TV contract that Stern and Silver worked out uh, has made the organization of the National Basketball Association bajillions of dollars, literally. Bajillions. You know, you get the idea. I'm just messing around with the word. But uh, major, 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 major success at the end of the day. God rest uh, the soul of David Stern. We will give him a moment of silence. With that said, I'm going to wrap up the show. Hope you can write a positive rating on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever. I, I think it's Apple mostly. But uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, Google Play Music, whatever. If you can write a positive rating for this show, that'd be greatly appreciated. I'll give you a shout-out and a thank you on air. Hope to hear from you from an audio submission. Just treat it like a recording. Use a, use the simple uh, uh, voice recording application on any smart device on the planet. Treat it like a phone call. Save it. Email it to paladinolive at yahoo.com. Paladinolive at yahoo.com would be greatly, greatly, greatly appreciated. Hope to hear from you that way. Five minutes, ten minutes, one minute, two minutes, whatever it is. Hope to hear from you. I will then convert it into an MP3 file. Thanks to Zamzar or Converto.com who provide a free service. So I am more than happy to give them a free plug. With that said, hope you all have a great week. Hope the Timberwolves continue their success into 2020 and things continue to head in a better direction. Hope guys get freaking healthy via sickness or injury. It would be nice to see a full roster and see some consistency like Gorgie Jang was talking about in the Star Tribune article, thanks to Chris Hine. Cool. Thank you for passing that on, Tene. Uh, Levi, pardon me. Thank you so much for passing that on. God bless you. Uh, check out the Courtside Podcast, and uh, we'll be back in a week.